ಪದೇನ ವಾಚಾ ಮಲಂ ಶರೀರ ವೈದ್ಯಕೇನ ಯೋಪಾಕರೋತ್ತ ಪ್ರವರ ಮುನೀನಾ ಪತಂಜಲಿ ಪ್ರಾಂಜಲಿರಾನತೋಸ್ಮಿ ಆಬಾಹು ಪುರುಷಾಕಾರ ಶಂಖಚಕ್ರಾಸಿ ಧಾರಿಣ ಹೋಪ್ ಯು ಬಿನ್ ಫೈಂಡಿಂಗ್ ದಿ ಎಪಿಸೋಡ್ ಸೋ ಫಾರ್ ಬೋತ್ ಯೂಸ್ಫುಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇನ್ಫರ್ಮೇಟಿವ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಪ್ರೀವಿಯಸ್ ಎಪಿಸೋಡ್ಸ್ ವೀವ್ ಬಿನ್ ಸೀಯಿಂಗ್ ವೆರಿ ಮೆನಿ ಸೀಕ್ವೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಪೋಸಸ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡಿಂಗ್ ಪೋಸಸ್ ಮೂವಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಫಾರ್ವರ್ಡ್ ಬೆನ್ಸ್ ಸಿಟ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಆಸನಾಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸೆಟ್ರಾ hope every previous episodes helps you understand the next episode the asana in the next episode a little better you must be thinking why we don't have simultaneous instructions for breath while practicing an asana pranayama translates to breath training in english however that's not the complete explanation pranayama indeed is a very very delicate subtle as well as a powerful state and therefore succeeds the practice of asana in patanjali's ashtanga yoga the reason why pranayama comes after asana is pranayama requires the organs of respiration to be able to expand contrast hold varying volumes of breath as well as function rhythmically these functions are established in asana while practicing an asana the necessary flexibility expansion contraction as well as tone is provided to the organs of respiration for that reason asana does precede pranayama also during the practice of asana every asana has its own pattern of breath for example sarvangasan uttanasana are particularly exhalative some uh, asanas have a retentive state some asanas are more inhalative in this way every asana has its own breath pattern that pattern must not be stifled while you do an asana you are experiencing that breathing even without your knowledge you are experiencing exalted states of exhalation inhalation retention all of which come as puraka rechaka and kumbhaka in pranayama so these breath patterns must be established in asana first before they are particularly introduced by the practice of pranayama for these reasons asana precedes pranayama after which one starts proceeding to a state where asana is done particularly for pranayama and then we move to the practice of pranayama as well In today's episode we will see Janu Shirshasan. The literal meanings of the word Janu Shirshasana, Janu means knee, Shirshasana, Shiras means head and therefore this is an asana which concerns the knee and the head as well. In this asana one leg is kept straight, the other knee is opened wide and then the practitioner moves forward in a spinal extension and touches the head towards the shin. we will now see the instructions for janu shirshasan we will now see how to do janu shirshasan now like all sitting poses of sitting forward extensions we start with dandasan in dandasan the thighs are kept together the feet are kept together the thigh is pressed down until the back of the thigh properly touches the ground similarly the heels are lengthened away the calf muscle therefore is also pressed to the ground the shins are pressed to the ground the knee also by the thigh's engagement and the shins engagement the entire structure of the knee is also pulled up at the knee caps and then pressed down heel is extended toes are passive but big toe mounds are active here the practitioner presses the palm rolls the shoulder back widens the chest widens the collarbones 
raises the sternum up. As you can see, the thigh must be kept down upon which the entire spine should raise up. It is therefore important that the structure of the abdomen lengthens away from the thigh. This should be a clear cut separation, the opposite where the chest sinks towards the thigh shouldn't happen. Pressing the palm, rolling the shoulder back, lift the entire length of the spine up such that the abdominal surface is clearly separated away from the groin. From this position, the legs are opened hip width apart. By hip width apart, the outer ankle and the outer hip must be kept in one line. From here, one leg is bent and taken wide like Baddha Konasana, where the knees are opened wide, the entire face of the leg is wide. Here, though we say the leg is like Baddha Konasana, there is a pertinent quality for Janu Shirshasana. On the bent leg side, the heel touches the groin. On the straight leg, the toe touches the thigh. So, it is not like the entire foot is against the straight leg or the Dandasan leg. The heel of the bent leg is against the groin of the bent leg. The toes of the bent leg is against the thigh of the straight leg. So the foot is at a diagonal. At this point, you have to once again press the hands, lift the chest, roll the shoulders back and the girth or expansion of the chest as well as the separation of the abdomen should be proper. I'd like to bring your attention to the bent leg side. On the bent leg side, the outer knee, that is the back knee, and the outer hip, that is the back hip, must be in one line. Here too, it's falling a little short. You will have to pull the leg back until the outer knee and outer hip are in one line. This generous opening gives good freedom to the area of the abdomen, which is very important for Janu Shirshasan. This is the leg structure of the Janu Shirshasan asana. It has to be properly underst understood as both legs are positioned differently. This being the first step from here, the practitioner moves to the second step which is the halfway or Madhyamastiti. Here as you notice, the sternum or the center of the chest keeps hanging towards the side of the bent leg. Nevertheless, the sternum should be positioned over the straight leg. Here, the practitioner first, before addressing that, must properly raise the sides of the body due to which the hands are taken in Urdhva Hastasana. The hands are taken in Urdhva Hastasana. The sides of the body is lifted tall. Now, when the body lifts, there will be a tendency of the buttock to come up. But you will have to press the thigh down, keep the groin soft and really try and turn towards the straight leg side in a way that the sternum is steered towards the straight leg side. The abdominal surface is steered towards the straight leg side without being tempted to lift the buttock. This is the second position. Here, in Urdhvastasan 2, the back ribs must be sucked in and the chest must be raised, the arm must be taken behind the ear. This is the second position. From there, the top arm on the left side is kept over the front of the left knee and the right hand is kept by the side of the right hip. With the palm pushing against the knee, the practitioner has to properly steer the sternum over the straight leg. There will always be a tendency for the sternum to hang over the bent leg side, but it's important to search for the medial positioning of the spine where the sternum is over the straight leg side. From there, once again, pushing against the knee, you will have to draw the back ribs in, position the sternum at the center, raise the chest up. This is the third position. From here onwards, trying to retain the centrality of the spine, the practitioner reaches for the foot, 
hand holding either sides of the foot holding either sides of the foot once again trying to position the sternum in the center pulling the back ribs in raising the chest up the elbow has to be locked this is the madhyama sthiti or the halfway position where a proper concave back the back ribs must be in sternum should be long sides of the body should be tall the throat should be well extended this position should be accomplished without lifting the buttock the buttock down groin soft sternum centered body sharply raised up back should be in concave back position this is the concave back position again a very important medial phase in the progression of the pose from here the elbows must be kept straight and the sternum should be kept tall those elbows that were locked in the madhyama or medial position must now be pulled wide such that the sides of the body as well as the center spine can travel far towards the foot it's not about the head dropping on the shin rather it's about the extension of the spine so the so the bentness of the elbow that is the bend of the elbow as well as the travel of the spine forward by which way the head finds its position on the shin should be the line of thought it's not about the head crashing on the shin it's about how the elbows can be pried open the sides of the body can be lengthened the center sternum can be lengthened by which way the head finds its position on the shin in this final position the elbows should be crisply raised up the head should be rested the abdomen should softly rest on the thigh the entire line of the torso is placed on the straight leg this is the final position of janu shirshasan for coming up you will have to reverse the steps you come back into concave back position with the chest lifted and then the hands are brought by the sides of the hip i would now like to draw your attention to three things that commonly happen in janushirshasan one is while going or progressing to janushirshasan sometimes the knee of the bent leg slips and comes forward this is the first thing usually while the thigh bends and comes forward it constricts the pose and therefore it's important to have the knee wide and the buttock pressed to the ground that is one correction do not allow the knee to slide forward the second scenario while going to the pose very commonly the practitioner may lift the buttock up and come pouring just with the eagerness to somehow take the head to the shin as you see there is a complete detachment of the sitting area away from the ground and then the practitioner leaves the sitting and then comes to place the head towards the shin that is wrong the buttock must be descended and placed to the ground the outer thigh must roll down to the ground when the buttock is lifted you come away from the outer thigh and go on the inner side that is wrong roll the thigh down keep the buttock down and then go to janushirshasan the third position i would like you to watch the back ribs keeping the knee back and the buttock down while you watch the rib cage what happens is there is a skewed spine as you can see the right side of the body shortens or the side of the straight leg shortens and the side of the bent leg swells up and therefore this is asymmetrical there is no symmetry in the inner organic content this needs to be adjusted 
you will have to roll the swollen side down and expand the compressing side outward so that in this position the head is placed you can see from the medial line there is a symmetrical distribution of ribs on both sides this is very different to this so you will have to really roll the abdomen down widen the ribs on the compressing side and suck in the ribs on the bent leg side so that the distribution of ribs are equal on both sides these are the three things that you need to watch out for while doing janushir shasan <laughs>
here you will have to go to the concave back position lifting the sternum up and tilting because usually when a person goes down it is this side that is the bent leg side of the sternum that doesn't integrate so the tilt of the spine is such that you really bring the sternum centrally over the thigh. Now here when the practitioner then goes the sternum is over the thigh, it's kept over the thigh, it's kept over the thigh, keeping it over the thigh then you proceed to Janu Sharshasan where the entire pose is developed on the integrity of the spine. I will show you yet another adjustment coming up. For people who are not able to hold the foot, you can then use a rope. The rope goes around the arch. Both hands hold the rope and then holding both hands over the rope, on the rope, you first have to nicely build that concave back or the Madhyamasthiti position that we were talking about. Concave back, back ribs in, sternum chest well lifted, throat relaxed and the abdomen sharply away from the thigh, buttock placed down. Here, holding the rope, you first build the concave back position. Here, if a practitioner is not able to hold the foot, then we use a rope. Now, to bring the uh, sternum over the medial, you then hold the rope with one hand such that the bent leg side hand holds both strands of the rope, the other hand is on the side, then keeping this generous length, release a little bit, keeping this generous length, the sternum is first built tall and straight, head is up, chest is up, keeping the, if I draw a line, as you see, the sternum to thigh is in one line. In this position, you then proceed to Janu Shirshasan, where once again you quickly hold both strands with two hands and then proceed to the final pose where the head is rested on the shin. Here you can see the rope also aids in bending or splitting the elbow wide, raising the elbows up so that the sides of the body are very sharp. A simple prop like a rope can be substituted also with a cloth but you can see how effective it is in achieving various principles of the pose. We now saw how to do Janu Shirshasan both in the classical form as well as prop supported variations. In the practice of Iyengar Yoga, props are introduced very meaningfully and purposefully. Props should be used wherever needed only and depending on the constitution and needs of every individual. In Janu Shirshasana, we have many benefits. Firstly, in the Madhyamasthiti or the concave back position, the anterior spine is very well extended. And then in the full position where the head touches the shin, the posterior spine is extended. Hence, adding the two up, the anterior and posterior spine, the length of the spine is fully extended in Janu Shirshasana. The abdomen in this pose is wide open and kept soft. And therefore, the openness of the abdomen is because the knee is open to the side and then the softness is by bending forward. When this happens, it is particularly useful for menstruating women, especially to cure or give relief to abdominal pain. Also, because of the posterior extension, the area of the kidney as well as the bladder is very well benefited. People with kidney as well as urinary problems find relief in this asana. Also, in the final position where the head is rested, it gives great relief to people with anxiety, stress, tension as well as depression because the head rested state calms the brain as well as the nerve and hence acts as a rejuvenating pose. In the following episodes, we will see more asanas. Until then, happy practicing. Mm -hmm.